Hi folks, welcome back. So last time we built ourselves a really simple audio mixer. We made two different types of preamplifiers, inverting and non-inverting, and we put them into a inverting summing amplifier using op amps. Go ahead and check that out if you've not seen it. One of the snags that we hit was the realization that there are circumstances that arise that mean that you need to flip the phase of one of your signals. So let me just quickly take a step back and explain what phase is and why it's important in audio. So to understand phase, we need to understand the fundamental properties of what makes a sound. So the cornerstone of understanding phase is understanding that all sounds can be broken down into sine waves. So we've all seen sine waves, right? This wiggly, up and down, curvy waves. So I could take the sound of my voice right now and represent it as a sum of sine waves changing over time. So when we're talking about 20 hertz, 100 hertz, 4 kilohertz, we're talking about how big is the sine wave at that frequency in that sound. So talking about the phase of that sine wave is talking about how do those sine waves stack up relative to one another. If you remember back to your math lessons at school, you'll probably remember that there's more than one type of sinusoid. We've got sine waves, which look like this, and we've got cosine waves, which look like this. These two waves are both the same wave, just one has a different phase to the other. And we have names for these two because they're special. We won't get into that here. So say we take two sinusoids and we look at the peaks and the troughs. If the peaks and the troughs line up with one another, then we say that those sinusoids are in phase and they will add together nicely and reinforce one another. If we take two sinusoids where the peaks line up with the troughs and vice versa, then we say that those sinusoids are perfectly out of phase and they will cancel one another out entirely. And obviously there's an entire spectrum of phase, phasiness in between those two levels. And so when we say we have two sound sources, which are obviously very complex additions of lots and lots of sine waves, all with different phases and amplitudes. And when we say two sources are out of phase, what we mean really is that some of the major components of that sound are out of phase and are canceling each other out. And if you get experienced in audio, you will immediately know what that sounds like because it's got quite a distinctive sound. So when you have multiple signals coming from sources that you have no control over the phase, you can get destructive phase cancellation. And what we need to do then is alter the phase of one of our signals so that we can shift those frequencies back into phase so we can mix things together without ruining our sound. So in this video, we're gonna have a look at a really simple technique to adjust the phase of one of your signals then we're going to extend that idea to attenuverters, something where you can flip the phase gradually. So let's go and have a look. Okay, so here we have the simplest form of a phase inverting circuit that I can think of. So how this works, it's quite an interesting little circuit. What we've essentially got here is we've got a little switch here. This is a switch. And where the switch is set changes the output from being exactly in phase with the input to exactly out of phase with the input. If we had an input that looked like this, right? If we had the switch set in, we'll call this the follow position. And I'll explain why in a second. The output would look like this. Whereas if we have the switch in this position, then that's in the inverting position. And the output would look like this. You can see how the output, the peaks have become troughs and the troughs have become peaks. And so we've got two settings here. And one of them is quite straightforward to understand. And the other one is a little bit subtle actually. And so in this configuration, we've got the non-inverting terminal grounded through this switch. And so this configuration just looks like an inverting amplifier. So I've gone over um, inverting amplifiers in many videos. Check out this op-amp playlist if you want to know more. Very brief recap. We've got negative feedback here. So these two inputs want to look the same. This input is ground. So the op-amp wants to make this input ground. So if we have a sine wave coming in like this, let's just say for ease of analysis, the op amp wants to make this point zero. So what it does is it just outputs the exact opposite of this sine wave so that when these two sine waves meet here, they cancel each other out and we just get zero volts here. You know, just a flat line, which is ground, right? So then we want these two resistors to be the same size, right? If we made this resistor twice as big, you can kind of think of that as the op amp has to work twice as hard to cancel this signal out with this signal and so this signal would be end up being twice as big. And that's how we get gain out of inverting amplifiers. As I said, I've done many videos on that. So check out this playlist. When the switch is set to the other position, what happens now? Now this can be a little bit tricky to get your head around. 
if you're not super confident with how analyzing op-amp circuits, I'll talk you through it. So just look at this and maybe pause the video for a second if you want and just try and think what you think should happen. I would forgive you for thinking that the output here should be zero. You might think, I know the op-amp is a differential amplifier. We've got the input here and we've got this same input coming through this resistor to here. So these two inputs are the same. So the op-amp has nothing to amplify. You might think, well, the op-amp wants to make these two inputs the same and we're just feeding the input directly into both inputs. So the two, op the two inputs are already the same, so the op-amp doesn't have to do anything. So the output is zero, right? If that's what you thought, that is a completely logical and reasonable thing to think, but is not what is going on. So because we have this negative feedback here, remember, the output does what it can to make these two inputs the same. And what we do know is we've got an unencumbered path for the input to the non-inverting terminal. So we know that the output wants to make these two inputs the same. So we know that the output is going to try and make this input look like this input, and this input just looks like an ordinary input. So what the output will do is just follow the input. Okay, so what's going on with this connection here? Well, if we assume an ideal op-amp, what the op-amp will do is immediately, as soon as the input comes in, immediately the output will become the exact same thing as the input. So as this rises up, let's just say to the peak, the output immediately puts that same voltage here. So let's say this is one volt here. The output immediately puts one volt here too. So there's no potential difference across this resistor, which means there's no current flowing through this resistor, which means this resistor looks like, if we think about Ohm's law, right, the resistance of this resistor is the voltage divided by the current. And so if there's no current and there's no potential difference either, then we can kind of think of this resistance as being infinitely large. And we think of infinitely large impedances as open circuits. So we're essentially using the op-amp feedback to take this resistor out of the circuit. In reality, there will be a small potential difference across this resistor. And that's to do with the gain of the op-amp itself and kind of complicated things that we'll get into in another video. But for now, we can approximate this circuit that it's making this resistor look like an open circuit for all intents and purposes because the error is very small. And so now if I just cover this resistor up, you can see that this is just a simple op-amp buffer. And then when we switch this back down to ground, the op-amp will change configuration again and we'll get an inverted output. Let's go up and have a look at that in action. So let's build one up here. So I'm just using a cable to emulate a switch. You need one of these where they click and stay in one position or another, except I got the ones that don't go on freaking breadboard. Because I've got the input fed straight from the input onto the non-inverting input, this is just in the follow-up mode, as I explained to you down the whiteboard. And if I just take this out and I connect the non-inverting input straight down to ground, we can see that now we've gone straight into the inverting configuration. Super simple, super straightforward, kind of unintuitive at first. If you, I can see how you could look at that circuit and be a bit confused. Hopefully that's all clear now and you can see this is so easy to make on a breadboard and um, you can just have a little switch that you can flick that changes the connection from ground to a direct connection to the input. And as you can see, we can flick back and forward between being in phase and 180 degrees out of phase. Let me just show you that with a different waveform. So here's a square wave and we can just flip that square wave out of phase. Obviously the yellow is the input and the blue is the output. Cool. So now let's take that concept a little bit further. So now what I want to show you is a really simple adjustment we can make to this circuit that takes it from this binary in phase, out of phase, in phase, out of phase to a continuous going from completely in phase continuously through to completely out of phase. And we can do that with one component. By nothing more than simply replacing our switch with a potentiometer, we can now go all the way from following, which is our gain of just one, through all the way to a gain of zero, all the way down to a gain of minus one, which is our inverter. In the jargon, you sometimes see the kind of circuit called an attenuverter because it attenuates and inverts at the same time. This is one of those circuits where it's a little bit easier for me to show you what's happening than blathering on on the whiteboard. So let's just go straight upstairs and have a look. 
So what I've done is I've just built that circuit up. It's very similar to the circuit that we just built, but just replacing that switch with this potentiometer. And what I wanted to show you instead of telling you is that what we've got here is very similar in behavior as well. So if we look at the scope, what we can see is that the two extremes of the potentiometer is with the potentiometer high, it just looks like a follower. And with the potentiometer all the way low, that's grounding the non-inverting input, making it look like the inverter again. How I want us to think of this, and if I just show you the non-inverting input here now in blue, you can see when it's grounded, obviously it's just ground. And when the potentiometer is all the way up, the input signal, which is in yellow, and the signal on the non-inverting input, which is there in blue, I'll just offset that by a volt, look the same. And so what I want us to think of this potentiometer is doing is it's taking a percentage of the input signal and putting it on the non-inverting input. So as we discussed before, the op amp will try and make those two inputs the same. So the interesting thing happens now where we have the potentiometer set halfway. Got the potentiometer set halfway, that's taken half of the input signal and put it on the non-inverting input. Input signal is there in yellow, the non-inverting input is there in blue, and what the output is doing to make the two inputs look the same is it's just setting itself to ground. And what that does is that basically enables these two um, resistors, the feed forward and the feedback resistor, to look like a voltage divider between the input and ground. The output makes itself look like ground, which puts half of the input signal on the inverting input, making the two inputs the same. If I just show you there, you can see that those two signals are the same, and wherever I have this potentiometer set, the output will make those two inputs the same, as we would expect. So this is quite a clever little circuit, and it allows you to vary continuously between the two modes that we had on the switch. And so what that attenuverter is doing is it's creating a signal at the output that is summed with the input signal to create this blue signal here. This is just the same thing as the summing amplifier we did from the last video, isn't it? If you see my last video, I did a summing amplifier where we put two signals into the input and we grounded the non-inverting input. The op amp wants to make the two inputs look the same, so it had to provide the equal and opposite signal to make that summing junction zero. This circuit is doing the exact same thing, only instead of setting the non-inverting input to ground, we're setting it to this blue waveform here, which is some effectively arbitrary sine wave. And we're kind of manipulating the knowledge that when we provide the same sine wave, we get a follower. And when we provide ground, we get an inverter. And so if we provide a signal in between those two states at the non-inverting input, we get an output in between those two states. Kind of makes sense, right? So let me just show you these circuits in context with our mixer and just let me show you how this all, these last two videos all kind of come together. Okay, so what I've done here is I've built up two channels of a kind of mixer like we were going through in my last video. Check that out if you've not seen it. And this time what I've added here is I found a switch that will go into my breadboard. So I've got a little switch here. And so this is the first circuit we looked at. And I've got a signal going through two channels of a mixer. They're both just an inverting configuration this time because it's a little bit easier and quicker to build. And then up here, we've got that summing mixer, again, like we looked over last time. Check that out if you've not seen it. And if we look at the oscilloscope here, what we've got, as we had last time, is we've got two signals that are perfectly out of phase, cancelling one another out. So if I turn one of these signals off, we can see at the output, which is in purple, we now see that we've got a signal. And as I turn this back up, we can see these two signals cancel each other out and the output goes down to zero. Okay, and so this is a time where we can just flip the phase of one of our circuits with this switch. And boom, they're now in phase. They now stack up. Out phase, in phase, out phase, in phase. Awesome. And we can now mix these two signals together. So that's just one of them. That's just the other. That's the one I'm triggering from, so that's why the oscilloscope went a bit mad then. And so that ties together the mixer stuff from last video with the phase inverting stuff of this video. And that attenuverter circuit that I showed you could actually be used to replace one channel of that mixer because it does the phase inversion and the gain at the same time if you only want a gain between 1 and minus 1. Obviously, if you want gain greater than 1, you have to use the proper mixer circuit. So what we've been looking at in the last couple of videos is how that negative feedback or the inverting amplifier is actually super 
super flexible and we can do loads of different stuff with it. We've looked at the summing amplifier, we've looked at inverting op amps in the past, we're now looking at this phase inverting circuitry and in the next video we're going to go on and look at an even more complicated phase altering circuit which you typically know as a phaser. I was going to do that as a part of this video but the video got quite long and it was quite a lot of information to take in in one video. It was about 40 minutes long as one long video so I'm splitting it in half so links down below as always to simulations and schematics and things like that. There's also a link down to my Patreon where you can support me if you've enjoyed my videos on the channel. That's the best way to support me and help me make sure I keep making these videos for you guys. Um, I upload bonus content on there, extra schematics, design videos, answering questions and all sorts of lovely stuff. So go over and check that out if you're interested. If you can't support me like that, then make sure you leave a like, subscribe, share it with your friends and most importantly, come back next time where there's plenty more synth stuff to come and I'll see you then. Bye bye.